Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our channel. Uh, of course, we are here in Kingfisher. And first of all, we'd just like to thank everyone for watching this video and for sharing all of our knowledge around. Guys, we just want to get out to everyone and just make the fishing community more informed and just help you guys catch your, your new personal best. So with that in mind, uh, please consider subscribing if you haven't already, click the bell icon and uh, like the video and share it around. So guys, today we are gonna be talking about a group of fish that are one of the most, probably the most popular um, species to target along most of the KZN coast and definitely the rest of South Africa as well. Today we are talking about the cob group. Now they're not all in the same genus. There are three in the Gyrosomus genus and then we've got two in separate genuses and we have hillback as well. So we're just gonna be talking about the, the three main cob. Then we're gonna split it up into just talking about duskies because they kind of form an, what I'd like to call an umbrella species. So learning how to catch them, you'll be able to target the other species and be able to catch them in very similar ways. So to so start it off, we have five species of true cob, if you wanna call them that. Now, the three that belong to the Gyrosomus genus is the dusky cob, Gyrosomus japonicus. Then you get the silver cob, which is a Gyrosomus inodorus, and the square tail, which is a Gyrosomus thorpei. So those are your three, your three true cob. Then you've got two that fall under the cob, the main cob group, and that'll be your snapper cob, which a lot of guys will know, snapper salmon, and your small cob. Now, snappers are Otoliths uh, rubeir, and your small cob is Jonius uh, dorsalis. Dorsalis, yeah. So those two we're not really gonna cover a lot. Uh, guys would have caught snapper salmon before along the coast. It's, we used to be able to target them quite easily. Now the, the, the numbers have gone quite low. It's actually quite difficult to actively go and target them. So we're gonna leave them one side. The small cob, very little is known about them. So we're gonna leave them one side. It's not a very common species. And we're gonna talk about the three, the three mains. And then of course, hillback, we're gonna do in a separate video completely. So stay tuned for that. Back to dusky, silver, and square tail. They are all very similar. So trying to tell them apart is actually a bit of an art. Um, the easiest way, the, the, the easiest way to do it is when you actually catch a cob, you smell it. Now it's gonna sound very, very weird to some people, but dusky cob have actually got a smell to them. It's like, it's a, it's a difficult thing to, to, to put into words, but it's, I find it quite a metallic-y kind of smell, and all of the dusky cob have it. They're also a lot slimier than the silver and the square tail, so they're often called snotties and things like that. When you, when, once you've picked them up, but obviously this could be, you know, just a bit of uh, random darts that are picked up, but the smell to me is the biggest thing. Otherwise, all three of them are very similar in shape. They are a, a sleek fish, but they're quite robust. So it's almost like an athlete. He's got a bit of shoulders to him. He's got a bit of bulk, but he's got a nice lean figure. He's, he's ready for action. Now, the dusky has got fairly large fins and that's where they get their name from, dusky. It's like a, a, a dirty yellow color. And that's on his fins, he's got that dirty yellow dusky color. Overall, they've all got those, that, those beautiful silver dots that run along their lateral line, um, which is how they hunt a lot of the time, is actually using that lateral line which we'll get into in a bit. And most of them have got that pinky sheen on the, the top of their head and along their back. And it works into silver onto the belly and sometimes a little bit of white right in the middle. But most of it is that silvery color. They got very large scales, um, which protects them. Oh, Spearers will know sometimes if you, just, if you don't hit it just right, you can actually, your spear can actually bounce off a cob. That's how hard they are. Tail shapes and difference, difference, differentiation between the, the silver and the dusky and the square tail and the dusky. Obviously square tail, it's in the name. The tail is actually square. It is the easiest one to tell apart from all the rest because the tail actually ends in a, <laughs> a straight line. The dusky and the silver have both got a lobe kind of tail. So it doesn't end in a straight line. It's got a bit of a curve out to it and things like that. It's got a bit more to it. And then the silver as opposed to the dusky, the silver, the peduncles, area, the pre-tail area, that uh, if you want to call it a stalk, I suppose you could, from the body to the tail, is a lot more elongated. So it's a bit more stretched as opposed to the dusky. So the way I look at it, dusky is a bit more chunky and he's got that smell to him. Silver's a little bit more elongated and then the square tail's got the square tail. Your dusky 
is the most distributed species. You get them all the way from the southeastern uh, seaboard, so southern side, down False Bay, all the way up on the eastern seaboard, up into Oman, Pakistan, India, goes all the way around to south, uh, southern and eastern Australia, goes to Hong Kong, uh, and then north up into China, South Korea, southern Korea, and Japan. So, I mean, very, very widely distributed. In terms of South African distribution, we talk about False Bay, so down in the Cape, all the way up to southern Mozambique. The, they prefer that slightly cooler subtropical to temperate kind of waters. Now, your silver cob, which is sort of the next most widely distributed, we're gonna get the endemic to Southern Africa. So you're not gonna find them up in the rest of the world and things like that, so they, the, uh, the Southern African species. Uh, you get a population that sits in Northern Namibia, so right at the top, and then you've got a population that sits from the Transkei down to False Bay. So not really in KZN, more down south and all the way into the Cape. And they've actually shown that these two populations don't mix. So at some point they were split and you've got two exactly the same species, but they completely separate from each other. So they don't interbreed or mix between the two populations, which is very interesting. You can actually possibly look at that in terms of genetics and how they're going to diverge into separate species, but we won't get into that now. Now the square tail you get from Mozambique, also southern Mozambique, so not into those tropical waters, all the way down into PE. So he's another species that you would get in KZN. So it's very easy to tell apart the square tail versus the dusky, said like that. With all of that in mind, we're now gonna speak about just the dusky cob itself, because targeting them, you're gonna target them in very similar ways that you would target the other species. So let's get into that. Duskies you're gonna get from near shore, actually, from the estuaries all the way through to about 120 meters deep. They rare deeper than that and all the way from that 120 mark in you're going to find them normally distributed around structure. The cob, most of them are fairly lazy fish. So although they are kind of athletically built, especially as teenagers, they they ambush hunters. So when you're targeting them, you often have to use a lot of movement in your bait and you have to keep moving and find where the fish are going to be. The juveniles, as we said, estuary based, so they really are dependent on estuaries and that's why a lot of our cob species are in dire need. They are, I think duskies are about 5% of the pristine number, so that's 95% of what would be a pristine population of dusky cob are gone. So that, just let that sink in a bit, we've lost 95% of what would be a proper, proper group of dusky cob, which is very sad, but we won't dwell on it because I don't want to cry. So, your... As we've had 120 through to, to the estuary side, uh, they do migrate. So some of your Eastern Cape and Western Cape uh, adults will move up into KZN during uh, winter, sort of with the sardines to come and spawn. And that's when you're gonna get your big aggregations offshore and where guys often catch a lot of, you know, the commercial guys will catch a ton, two tons on some of the big boats of cob. Cause it's these breeding aggregations that group together on a, a reef or a little, um, or a wreck or something like that, any sort of structure around the bottom, they'll aggregate around that and then they'll all get together and that's when the guys will catch a whole lot of them because they're all grouped in one small section. And that's often where we look at from a protection conservation side is we try and get those areas that the, where the cob and where garrick and things like that aggregate, you look at protecting those because then if those can get protected, then the population will spill out into a lot of different areas and actually just build back up again. So we need to protect as best as we can. Now, your size-wise, your males will um, mature at about 95 centimeters, females at about 105, so almost a meter, both of them, so it's a, it's a big fish. And that, I believe, was about four and five years, respectively, so fairly slow growing um, to get to that size, but they, they can reach a total, if I ch cheat and look at my notes, the, I think the theoretical max size of a dusky cob was about Two, just over two meters, which is absolutely massive, and about 80 kilos. But that fish would have been, would be about 42 years old. So we're talking about a long, long, slow growing fish, but that is massive. I mean, 80 kilos of a fish, of, of fish, not shark or anything like that. It is, it is very, very big. Now, in terms of targeting, when we look at cob, the biggest thing that's come out in the last sort of, I'd give it about five, six years, is the use of paddle tails. Now, paddle tail is basically a rubber fish shape with a boot 
shape on the, on the end of, the, end of the, where the tail would be. And what happens when you pull that through the water, that tail kicks. So everywhere else in the world, um, Australia, America, they're going to call them uh, swim baits because that's you fish it, you swim it. Now we fish those on a jig head to get them down to the bottom and to obviously give you casting distance. And that method of fishing, I think, has caught more cob in the last little while and taken more people into cob fishing than bait ever did or ever will. Because bait, you know, smelly and things like that, a lot of people don't like that. The lure fishing appeals to a lot of people because it's quick, it's efficient. And also, go, if you go, say hypothetically, you're gonna go to a beach, you're gonna go fish a sandbank for a cob, you're gonna cast and you're gonna have your bait there, you're gonna leave it for a while. You're gonna say, oh, there's no bite. You're gonna move along a little bit or change bait, fish the same spot. With the lure fishing, you're gonna fish that entire sandbank, say it was this table, and the cob were only sitting here. You're gonna fish all the way along until you hit them. And then you'll catch cob for cob, every, or one cob with each throw. So it's a lot more efficient way of working it. And in terms of how to retrieve those things, it's cast, let it sink all the way down to the bottom. Cob don't feed on the surface, they feed right near the bottom. And a nice steady retrieve on the, steady and slow on the thing. You don't want to whip it around and move it and do a lot of jumps and things like that. But you just get that paddle tail kicking and moving along the bottom. They used to do it with the Rapalas, the big CD19s and things, but now the paddle tails are just, with them being soft, they, they produce a lot better vibration, a bit, lot better movement to the, to the cob themselves. So paddle tailing is my personal preference. Other ways of targeting them, live baits, which uh, Ray will show you how to rig them up and things like that. Most fish will work uh, as a live bait for them. And yeah, it's just finding where they're feeding. So with cob as opposed to garrick, you're not sliding along with a, not, with a return clip because the garrick feed in the zone. Cob will sit in a hole or next to a rock or things like that. So you're actually sliding with a non-return most of the time, and you're sliding into a hole to put the bait in that one spot or throwing it and putting it in one spot. So guys, your, in terms of your regulations and things around cob, a lot of them, because they're so difficult to actually tell the differences between a lot of the species, they've done more of a broad spectrum uh, kind of regulations on it. So anything that's caught east of Cape Agullis, you're allowed one per person per day from the shore, uh, one cob per person per day from the shore. Anywhere west of Cape Agullis, so that's into False Bay and things, you're allowed five. That also applies if you're offshore along KZN as well. So as long as you're from the shore in Eastern Cape and KZN, consider one per person per day. From the boat or from in Western Cape, you're allowed five per person per day. Size limit wise, 60 centimeters total length. That's if it's caught east of Cape Agullis. Um, or from the shore or from in estuaries and 40 centimeters in KZN and 50 centimeters total length in Eastern Cape and Western Cape if they caught from a boat. There's a lot of uh, intricacies there. As I always say, uh, rather limit your catch and keep fish that are a bit bigger than, than just the size limit. So for example, like Shad with 30 centimeters, rather keep stuff that's 35, not just on the limit. At least give the fish a little bit of a chance to, to do their thing. And a nice thing what they've done with um, with cob themselves is that you're not allowed to keep fish that are too big. So they're protecting the the big uh, females and the big uh, the breeding stock. So if you catch, you're only allowed to catch one cob in that limit. So whether it's one or whether it's your five, you're only allowed to keep one that's bigger than a meter, 1.1 meters. So that protects those those big females that have a lot more eggs that they normally keep and a lot healthier stock. So it's, it's protecting those those um, the big fertile females that they that we have in our population as um, with measurements and things like that we often get asked how to measure certain things cob are measured total length so if you put the fish down the easiest way is on keep them on wet sand never put dry sand or rocks it actually takes the slime layer off it's very very bad for the fish you want to either measure from the tip of the nose to the tail with the measuring tape along the body a more accurate way is to put a little stick in the ground at the tip of the nose and at the tip of the tail so if you push the tail together you'll get the spot. Because it's a rounded dish tail, it'll be the total length. So right to the, the, the longest piece of the fish. And then that's your total length of the fish. So all the way along that section. Now guys, uh, we will always, or at least I will always punt good information and useful information. And that is our, the Ori Fish app that, that Bruce Mann and his team have done. Now, they luckily have got all the, the cob species on there. It's very, very user friendly. You can get it for your Apple or your Android, obviously. And on there, you can look at all the different species of cob and the similarities. You've got pictures, you've got size limits. Everything is right there for you, easy to use. Uh, the link is below if you guys want to download it. It is a pay app, so it's not for free, but you pay once and that's it. So 
I really recommend that. It helps support our uh, research and moving into the future. So, guys, the cob as a whole, as a group, very, very interesting species. They've got, most of them have got teeth, but very, very small as opposed to the snapper salmon, got a little bit longer canines. But they are beautiful fish. They are mostly endemic. So really look at protecting them and keeping as few as possible. They are already being hit by pollution and things in the estuary. So try and protect them as best you can and consider putting them back and keeping something that's a little bit more user-friendly. Cheers, guys.